I'm, uh, and I'm, uh, as you probably know, also with the CWI database architectures. Uh, this is one of these talks that have been vetted by the stringent review of Hacker News. So um, if you have seen that, uh, you probably saw some of the content already. Apologies uh, for that. But in a nutshell, let's let's uh, let's do a brief intro. Okay, what is aggregation? We are trying to compute some sort of summary, usually some sort of statistical summary over huge big data, obviously. Um, and this can be uh, optionally aggregate grouped by some arbitrary group uh, in SQL. This is group by, and uh, it's very diff difficult to imagine data systems that don't support uh, group aggregation in some way. Although uh, I've been told it's quite difficult in TensorFlow. Um, Group I, uh, and it's kind of funny because the, the group I is this cardinality changing operator where if a aggregation uh, exists, it will uh, drastically change the cardinality of the result to the amount of groups that exist in the data. Um, and we've actually just, this was kind of funny because while thinking about this, uh, we thought also about the madness of SQL in this regard because you know the, the presence of a function that has a special name in a list of arbitrary complex expressions turns this query into an aggregation, which is, which is, if you think about it, it's quite mad, right? Because it's everything is implicit, you know, it's like it really depends on whether your system catalog thinks whether this is an aggregation function or not, and then boom, everything changes. Um, that was just something that came up while thinking about this. I thought this was quite fascinating. Um, now let's say we want to do aggregation. What are the problems that meant the problem dimensions? Like what makes this very difficult? Uh, we have the number of rows in the input. Obviously, that is a factor. Um, it's probably easier to do aggregation on 10 rows than on 10 billion rows. Um, the but the like but that's kind of okay. Still, the most painful uh, factor, I think, is the number of groups that you have in your input, like the like the number of distinct combinations of the grouping columns. So the grouping amount of grouping columns also plays a role. But overall, I think what we've seen is that the, the number of groups is, is what makes this painful. You also have a slight kind of side note here, the, the data types of the grouping columns, like say it's probably harder to aggregate on strings than it is on uh, to aggregate on integers. But um, but that's a that's bit of a linear overhead, let's say. Uh, and uh, the number of groups is what actually hurts. Um, we also have some other factors, for example, the, the number of uh, aggregates, for example, sum, min, max, and so on and so forth. You can have, of course, an arbitrary number of those to compute. And if you have very many of them, this might also become complex. Um, what is more relevant is what kind of aggregates um, you want to compute. Like, are these streaming aggregates, uh, like something like a sum? Uh, or are these more involved ones uh, like quantile where there's no uh, straightforward streaming way of computing them? Uh, something that is also relevant, but let's say less immediately clear why it's relevant is the distribution of the groups in the input. For example, you could imagine groups being uh, pre-sorted, uh, somehow clustered, partitioned in your input that will probably change the way uh, you want to compute those groups. Um, and uh you also have this uh yeah the the amount of values that that fall into every group that is uh also a big difference that also may has a big impact on the on the performance of the overall system for example uh i always like to call it just the, the justin bieber problem where you know one group has a, a billion and uh, like values that fall into it and others have none uh, of course, that is a different kind of problem than if you have a uniform distribution over between the uh, number of uh, like rows that belong to each group. Um, the most sort of traditionally, what people would do is they would sort. Um, and in fact, there are some data systems out there. Let me just show you the slide I wanted to skip, but I think it was too, it's too funny to skip now. Um, so the traditional way of doing this is to sort and then aggregate. And this is, oh, I cannot show this. I cannot show you a skipped slide. That's annoying. There we go. Um, no, it's still not there. Huh? We Sorry, have I'm, half seen it, your Excel slide. You have half seen it. Yes. Now it's unskipped. There we go. Uh, so this is just, you know, in preparation for this, I thought this was funny to look at what Excel does and Excel does sort. So in Excel, you sort the input and then you click this subtotal button that I didn't know existed. And then it gives you a group aggregates. Very nice. 
But this is um, can be done better because, of course, sorting uh, as much as people have worked on optimizing sorting uh, still has uh, analog and complexity. So the way to do this uh, better is with aggregate hash tables. And how does this work? Well, we build a, a giant hash table. Uh, we have uh, the key for our hash tables are the groups and the aggregate states. That's uh, might not might not necessarily be the final result of the aggregate, but state like. For example, you might imagine that uh, a running average has a different state than its final result. Anyways, those are the entries of the hash table, and then we'll add data until we're done uh, to our hash table, and this is O of n, which is much better. Um, and once we have added all the values to our hash table, and of course the hash table makes sure we put all the data into the correct groups, uh, we have to possibly finalize the aggregates and emit the results. So, so far, so good. This is not quite... This is like, like a three line Python script if you wanted to uh, use a dictionary or something like that. But that glosses over some complexity. For example, what if you have hash collisions? Here's a, in the slide, we have two groups, uh, one and five that uh, in this simplified world hash to the same uh, hash table offset, namely one. Uh, we have the collision. Obviously, this is an ancient problem. Um, and uh, we can choose between chaining or linear probing. In the world of in-memory systems, we probably want to use linear probing because it has actual locality, which means that um, by just going to the next hash bucket, uh, we will um, be able to, um, you know, uh, have locality in, in the overflows as well. So now there's a slide I did. I, I, this is, doesn't make no sense. It shows me the next slide, but it's not the correct next slide. This is like... Somehow my, my, uh, my keynote lets me down today. But anyways, um, one of the problems with uh, hash tables is that we don't want, but we don't know um, a priori how many groups there are gonna be. And we don't wanna start with giant hash tables because uh, we wanna, again, for locality reasons, wanna start with a small one. Um, and if we reach this like weird problem where we run out of space in our hash table, we actually managed to degrade our uh, insertion performance from O1 to ON because for chaining, eventually everything will be in the same group and for linear probing, eventually the world will just stop. The solution is to resize. The problem with resize is that when we resize the hash table, we'll actually uh, move most of the data in it around. It's a lot of movement. It gets particularly problematic when you have a lot of groups, when you have a lot of payload columns, um, then you're moving a lot of data. Um, which is why um, we propose to use a two-part hash table, uh, which is basically uh, particular, like you have two different sort of things. One is the, the pointer array, which basically is a, a level of indirection um, where you go from the hash, ent hash map entry, hash entry if you want, to the actual payload. What is the payload? The payload is the grouping uh, column values and the aggregate states. Um, and that allows you to do resize without actually touching those group uh, column values and the aggregates with the slight problem that it will create this indirection on data access. So here's an example. I have this uh, example hash table here. We have on the left, I have a data table T and I insert that into my hash table. That's the two part hash table. So in the middle, we have the pointer array, the offsets basically that just points into the um, payload blocks and the payload blocks are these things on the right where we have the grouping values so one and seven you can recognize that from the left side are the grouping uh, values and the, the, the aggregate state in this case for the sum um, and you can see that there's all these like little errors there that show you how this all glues together now if I want to resize this hash table because it just ran out of space uh, you know in this example here I want to insert three but I don't have space in my hash table so what do I do well I resize my hash table I make for example uh, twice as big and then I have to reshuffle all the pointers but I can leave the payload blocks completely alone uh, and in fact I will just add a new payload block in this case block three that now has the group the group number three together with the the, the, the sum of ten and that are just and as you can see because I made it gray um, this allows me to completely ignore the uh, other blocks that I haven't touched and that makes a huge difference for the um, yeah, amount of memory I have to shuffle around for resizes. It makes the resize cheaper. Well, um, there's one problem here and that's the indirection. Um, if I basically in this, in this setup with the uh, two-part hash table, 
if I'm if I find a if I want to ins like insert some data, I, I hash the grouping columns. I'll look uh, I'll look up the entry in the hash table, and I will see that oh, there is already an entry there. What I will have to do then is to do a group compare. In order to do the group compare, I will have to actually look at my payload blocks to do to compare my group from group uh, values from the data with the group values in the payload blocks. And as a double indirection, and of course that is evil. So uh, one optimization. Uh, for that is something we call salted pointers, where we extend the uh, pointer array uh, with some extra, like some bits of the of the hash uh, of the groups. And why would you do that? Well, it allows you to early determine that a particular uh, hash table entry is potentially that group that you're looking for, or cannot be the group that you're looking for. And that has this nice effect that it greatly, greatly uh, uh, reduces the amount of uh, pointers that you have to chase to do the group compare on insertion. And for probing, of course, as well, if you do linear probing, you have to do a couple of those. And by having these extra uh, pointer, uh, the extra hash bits in the pointer array, uh, you will be able to do an early um, abort of these, of these lookups. Um, the downside, of course, is that the, the hash bits that we're putting into the pointer array, they take extra uh, storage space, extra memory, and it's in fact a bit of a trade-off there because the pointer array is something that we try to keep small also for the locality um, and cache residency of the uh, of the hash table. But at the same time, we we do benefit a lot from the from the having these salts like these bits of the hash of the groups there. So then the trade-off is how many bits of the uh, of the hash do we put in the uh, in the pointer array. Uh, you know, uh, and against the extra cost of storage. Um, so I think we do like one byte or something like that. It seems to have been a good compromise. Um, there's another optimization that we've done in the um, aggregate hash table, uh, which is the caching the actual hashes, because while we put the group values in our in payload blocks here, the, the G, as you can see there, um, in our simplified world of this slide, you know, sometimes the world is not exactly as it is on the slides. I hate to tell this to you, but in our simplified world of the slides, um, we of course have just used the identity hash function, but when you compute an actual hash on possibly multiple uh, group columns, that computation can actually take a long time. And this is particularly interesting when resizing, because when we resize the hash table, we have to compute, we have to compute the new positions of every group in the new uh, pointer array. So by caching the, uh, the hashes themselves as well in the payload blocks, we can resize by simply throwing away the, uh, the pointer array and then scanning all the payload blocks in order to reinsert. And we don't even have to recompute the hashes of the group columns because we already have them in the payload blocks and we can simply modulo them and reinsert into our hash table. This is really, this is really elegant. Um, however, again, we are um, spending um, storage space on the hashes, although it's less critical in the payload blocks uh, because they're not like a, a single continuous block of memory. It's still it's still a trade-off uh, to consider. It's like how many how many hash bits do you want to put in the payload blocks? You could also think of um, just doing a suffix of the hash because you're doing a modulo in the end. So probably the first the the, the high bits there are not going to be relevant for that modulo end. So that's an interesting optimization as well. But this is all well and good. Um, we have now talked a bit of how can we do aggregate hash tables. But of course, the interesting part is where we uh, look at parallelism. How do we do this in parallel, right? Um, and yeah, we want to be able to compute multi the aggregation in parallel. We want to have multi-core with one computer. And of course, uh, some people also want to do multi-node with many computers. But let's focus on the multi-core uh, thing first. Hash tables are one of these things that um, is quite difficult to parallelize a single hash table. Um, and yes, there are approaches and they are, have various sort of trade-offs, but I think the, the summary there is that it hasn't, let's say, it, it, there's no free lunch there because um, yeah, usually you either have to use locks or you have to use structures that don't do what you really want them to do. Uh, the resize becomes super problematic um, if you have, uh, if you if you have to consider parallel access to this to this thing, so it becomes a bit of a problem. Um, traditionally, 
historically what people have used is the exchange operator. And I mean, and you have just been a dark tool with Goetz, I, he I heard, yes. So, uh, so uh, or was he not there? Goetz was there in spirit. In spirit. Well, I, I think that's very fitting, no? Um, so, so he was just a voice from the wall, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. He was remote, but not all the time. Ah, okay. So here's this paper from, this is actually a seminal paper from uh, Götz Gräfe from 1994, where he describes not only the volcano model, but also uh, exchange operator parallelism, which is the traditional method uh, where we basically want to kind of get parallel aggregation or joins working without having to actually rethink our operators. And basically, uh, with the logic of the exchange operator, we would be able to use our aggregate hash table like we just described without actually having to rethink it by simply um, basically, uh, for example, partitioning the data, doing separate aggregations, then combining the, the pre-aggregated data, doing a finalize, and then, um, then handing off the result. And this is coincidentally how a wonderful, uh, excellent piece of software uh, called Apache Spark uh, does it, um, which uses the exchange operator that uh, to basically deal with uh, parallel aggregation. So here we have a uh, example query, select G1, G2, some D count star from some table, group by G1, G2. Um, okay. And if we look at the uh, plan that Spark can output for this, and it will look like this in many systems, like Postgres has exactly the same plan and so on and so forth. But you can see on the bottom, we have a scan. In this case, it's scanning a parquet file. Then it's aggregating uh, on the G1, G2, shockingly and uses these uh, aggregate functions, partial sum, partial count, which you probably can guess why, because it's a pre-aggregation, the, the things operate differently. Uh, then we have the, the hash partition exchange operator, which basically puts everything that belongs to the same group in the same uh, partition for the next step. Uh, and that next step is the hash aggregate that will finalize the sum and the count. Um, you can see this uh, interesting 200 there, which is the number of partitions, This of course, can be problematic uh, with uh, some, um, you know, some data distributions. If you have a lot of groups um, or very few, it depends really. So, so this is uh, how this works. Uh, I do think I have time for a quick demo, just to show you how this is like a hard problem grouping. So let me see. Can you see my? Can you see my? Can you read my my shell here? No, not really. Now we can see it in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so I'm just going to use Python here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate some dummy data. Um, so this group data set has uh, 100 million rows. And I'm going to generate data that has 1 million groups. So it's not, it's not so crazy. And I'm going to use uh, um, NumPy and my, uh, and uh, pandas to make that data frame. It's this is just the data generation part. I just uh, just have to run that. And now, if I look at the uh, size, this is a data set in memory of 3.2 gigabytes, so not particularly crazy. I am going to run this. I write this to Parquet files, so Spark can read it. Um, and uh, let's see. Now we should have. Now we have the query plan I just showed to you. So here we have the, the scan, we have the hash aggregate, we have the exchange, we have another, another aggregate, and then we're done. And if I now run this, um, I will have to go back to my slides because it's taking a while to complete. Uh, there's some warnings here, but this is, I think, part for the course. Um, so what are the problems with the hash uh, exchange uh, operator? Or they generally aggregate uh, the exchange operator well. The um, while it does allow parallelism, um, the partitioning is static, so it has problems adapting to. Um, if you want to change a degree of parallelism, if you if you find that your grouping, uh, uh, if your group distributions are, are off, you're going to have a problem uh, with static uh, partitioning. You do actually move a lot of data around. If your groups occur in lots of the partitions, then you have your intermediates become quite large. Yeah, and as I just mentioned, the group imbalance is a problem. Um, so can we do better? Yes, we can do better. There's these two papers that 
describe ways around these problems. There's the DB2 uh, blue paper from 2013, and then there's the morsel reparalysis paper from uh, Sigma 2014. And what do those uh, papers propose? Well, um, the concepts, the, the, while the details are slightly different, the concept is the same. Uh, we kind of abandon this idea of the exchange operator where we say, okay, we can kind of hack parallelism into a system without touching the actual operators. And this is abandoned in this by these proposals um, where we say, okay, we have to actually redesign the aggregation operators and others uh, to support parallelism. And, you know, for example, using this method of pipeline parallelism. Um, how does this work? Well, uh, we have uh, multiple threads that are running. They're reading subsets of our input, and uh, each thread builds up aggregate aggregate hash tables. And they do this, for example, using the aggregate hash table method I've just uh, described to you. Uh, and then the trick is to start Radix partitioning uh, your hash tables into separate hash tables in every thread. Well, this sounds quite counterintuitive. There's a very good reason for it. And the reason is that if you do this, we can actually parallelize the finalization step as well. It's quite similar to what happens in the exchange operator, only that we are basically using uh, these hash tables uh, as intermediates instead of um, you know, things that look like tables. And this is very, very interesting. Uh, for various reasons. So here's an example how this works. So we have our data on the left. Um, and instead of immediately throwing that into a, a hash aggregate table, we will first, in this case, do a very uh, stupid check. Okay, we will take the hash of the group and we'll end it with uh, you know hexadecimal eight and we'll see if that is zero, it goes into the first partition, and if it's one, it goes into the second partition. And if we add the values that, that we have in our uh, T1 here, we will see that, okay, some of the values, they go in one hash table and some go in the other. That was uh, very predictable. Um, we'll just pick some bits from the group hash and based on the group hash, we decide which hash table those things go into. And in the second phase, we will just assign all the hash tables for the same partition uh, to one of, the, one of our merging threads uh, for example, in this case, we will have the first hash table of thread one and the first hash table of thread two. And then we'll combine those hash tables um, into a new combined hash table. Um, and we will have our final result uh, because at this point we are done. We know that no group information can be in any other partition because we just read the Radix partition on the group hash. Um, there's one slight complication here that we have to have combinable aggregates, but we already have this problem. Um, yeah, this is just, we have this problem all the time in, in, in these in these aggregate uh, re-aggregations. Uh, re right? This is also a problem in the uh, exchange operator. Here's a here's a picture from the paper. I find this uh, sometimes hard to hard to understand. So, uh, but uh, but this shows you the same concept where we have individual uh, portions of the input. Uh, put into different partitioned hash tables by thread, and then those being merged into a, into a secondary aggregation phase. So this is really cool because it can do multiple things. It can adapt to imbalanced group sizes. So if I have uh, one group is particularly big and another group is particularly small, it doesn't really matter because uh, they will all kind of uh, this will all disappear already in the in the scan phase, and I will only merge hash tables. It can adapt to a very, very large group count um, because I'm partitioning the work of merging these things. Um, and uh, yeah, I can basically choose what Radix I'm going to use for the partitioning. It is very, very good at exploiting supportive data distribution where, um, for example, the data is already pre-clustered uh, uh, around uh, across the threads that, um, that scan, scan the input. Um, we can ad hoc adjust uh, the parallelism, the degree of parallelism, because basically we, we, can, we, can we can decide to just assign these merge tasks, uh, just reassign these merge tasks. And uh, what also is very nice that the payload uh, blocks that can just stay in place and we don't have to actually uh, touch them. The downside is that all this partitioning and merging is of course not free. So there are some optimizations here. Um, when we uh, 
start when we start using this this merging hash tables approach. So for the first one is that we would only start doing the partitioned hash table approach when the entry count exceeds exceeds some threshold. And this is a thread local decision. So every thread can locally decide, hey, my hash table have has has grown, uh, you know, beyond a certain amount of values. Therefore, I will be start. I will be now um, uh, re, uh, like start to partition it. And there's this thing that is like a lemmings thing. You know, if all of if one of them jumps, all of them jump because once one of the threads part starts partitioning the hash table, uh, eventually all of them will have to because we have to. Otherwise, we have no good way of merging them. Uh, another super interesting approach, and that's also from the blue paper, is to is to is to basically say we shall abandon a thread local hash table, not in the sense that we throw it away, but we will stop adding values to it. And we will just keep it for later, basically um, trading off the fact that we have to eventually merge that stuff to the size of the hash table that we're currently building in the scan of each thread. And we probably want to, the, the trade off there is that, of course, at some point it's going to be cheaper to merge than to have an increasingly large hash table to, to, uh, to, to kind of jump around in, especially when we have very many groups. Um, and that is that is a very that's very interesting optimization that we've also built into into DuckDB to basically, at some point, just stop using a specific hash table because it also allows you to explore data distribution. Say you have data that is very, uh, you know, distributed all over the place in one one part, but then there's actually a second part that is constant, has everything has the same value. We will we will um, we will benefit a lot from having a smaller hash table on the second part, and that allows us to do that. Um, what's also super cool is we can, because that's something that comes back from the two part hash table, we can actually early release the pointer array once we have merged a particular partition because we don't need it anymore. The, the nice thing about the two part hash table for the scan, which is like finalizing and putting out results, we don't actually need the pointer array anymore. So we can early release it, which reduce, reduces memory pressure. Um, so that's really cool. Um, what does this mean? Well, here's a here's a very small experiment. Uh, if you want, want to read more, there's a, a blog post link there. Um, basically, here we have some some systems that do aggregation. We vary the group count on the x-axis and we measure the time on the y-axis. This is a log log plot, right? So uh, be warned. Um, and we can see that you know comparing DuckDB to all these data frame libraries in Python, uh, that uh, that you know all these optimizations we just talked about have quite some impact. Um, some other considerations, um, uh, which are, okay, how can we actually uh, go out of core with this? Because it's, of course, an important factor when dealing with an arbitrary amount of groups. Um, and this is something that we're still working on. Uh, but uh, basically, the idea is that because we have these radix partitions of our partitioned hash tables, we can basically go arbitrarily deep in this partitioning. Um, and since the, the groups will always have, you know, different groups will always will have different hashes most of the time, we will actually not run into these uh, distribution problems provided the hash function works well. And we can just sub, keep sub partitioning uh, hash tables until the merging, the, the hash table we need to build for the merge fits in, fits in memory. So that's kind of the idea that we have there. Um, let me go back to my demo there quickly. Um, because I think um, by now it should be done. But regrettably, um, Spark wasn't able to finish this aggregation. But obviously, there is a there is a there is a um, you know there is a happy ending here because I can just jump, run DuckDB on this and then it's done. So that uh, is just um, trying to show you a little bit about our aggregate hash table. Uh, I'll be happy to take uh, any of your questions.